I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're talking to Dr. Joan Nihal, a forensic psychologist, best-selling author, and renowned expert on happiness. With over 35 years of clinical experience, she delves into the secrets of achieving lasting happiness. In her latest book, it is called Happy is the new healthy. We are delighted to have Joan in the spotlight today. Thank the folks at Good River Print and Media for helping us put her in the spotlight today. And ask viewers like you to support writers like her by subscribing to our channel. Joan, thanks so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. My pleasure. I love your book. Even the cover kind of makes you feel happy. It's bright, mm -hmm. it's vivid. So I'm gonna start out with this question. What is happiness? Well, it's been defined as subjective well-being, a sense of meaning in your life. Aristotle talked about happiness as being the purpose of being alive in the fourth century BC. And he talked about eudaimonia or meaning. And at the same time, Zianzi in China was saying that the important thing in life is to be happy. So it's subjective well-being. So it's what makes you basically feel good. Yes, exactly. And I'm not talking about toxic positivity or giggly at all times, because my research shows that happy people can have down times too, like you and I. The secret is that they they are resilient. They know how to bounce out of it quickly. One of the sayings, and I think I've coined it and I use it a lot, I say happy people are happy not because of their circumstances, but despite their circumstances. You can put a person who's got a set point of happy anywhere, including prison, and they'll find a way to be happy. You can take a person whose set point is unhappy and put them anywhere, you know, the White House or a mansion on the sea, and they'll still find reasons to be unhappy. Do you agree with that? Yes, and do you know why that happens? I don't know. Well, the, here's the thing. You see, the research shows that we have a set point of happiness, as you said, but the point is, as William James said, the greatest weapon we have against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. And mm -hmm. that's what these people are doing. You know, they say the glass is half full versus half empty, as you're saying. I mean, you're right. I mean, in prison, do you remember that case? It slips my mind right now. It's not psychology. But this guy who was put in jail uh, for uh, over 40 years yeah. and he was not. Do you remember that case? And he was actually innocent. But the thing is that when he was in jail, he was a model prisoner, helped other people. And when he was released, because they found out with DNA, the guy was actually innocent, they questioned his happiness. How did how was he able to do it? And he was able to transform it by finding meaning, even though he was innocent. Now, that's a huge one to share. It is. It is because you're not only imprisoned, you're wrongly imprisoned. Precisely. So, yeah. And so, you know, negative Nellies, what they would do is say, oh, woe is me, life is terrible. The guy was, uh, you know, of African descent. There, you, you know, you're being a prejudiced against me, blah, blah, blah. Right. He, he was just an amazing inspiration for the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, you look at the pandemic. Yes. Look at the pandemic. Two and a half years and people were whining and complaining while others like you and I are saying, hey, this is danger, but it's opportunity as well. Hmm? Exactly. Yeah, I, had a, I had a blast during the pandemic. I'm, I, mean, I don't mean to gloat, but, you know, I took a lot of walks. I spent read a lot of books. I spent time with my dogs. I spent time with my wife, uh, you know, and we just enjoyed our lives, kind of unplugged, uh, kind of not having any responsibility. We were fortunate that our finances were OK. But, uh, you know, you're right. I could have dwelled on the fact, well, my industry acting and broadcasting is shut down. Uh, you know, you can always... It, you need to choose your focus, I guess, is what I'm saying. And I guess you agree. Yeah. Did you find during the pandemic, you talked about becoming more introverted, thinking things through. Did your relationships with others also change? Because a lot of my patients said to me, you know what, Joan, I've had to call some of my friendships. They're not really friends and pick different. Did you find that happen to you? I, I found that exactly happened to me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you would communicate with people, you know, through social media, often they would be venomous towards you for some reason. Um, I guess these were your loose ties, people you weren't that connected to. Other people with whom you were connected strongly, I think those bonds became even stronger. I know a lot of couples broke up during the pandemic and a lot of couples decided to get married 
during the pandemic because they realized that this is a person if locked away on an island I could survive with. And a lot of people decided to have babies during the yeah. pandemic. In other words, we got off the fence, you know, and made quick decisions that were important ones for ourselves. Yeah. 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 It's the best of times and the worst of times, as Dickens likes to say, or did as he once wrote. Did you hear of the term post-traumatic growth? Have you heard I have that? not. You always hear post, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, but you don't hear about <laughs> growth, right? Well, I want to talk to you about growth because this is so hot. It's so exciting because, you know, people are languishing, but people are also flourishing. And I have a little way of doing it with people, teaching you how to do it, because to flourish, you have to have habits and habits change the way we look at life. But let me talk a little bit about post-traumatic growth. What I found with a lot of my patients is that during the pandemic, they embraced new possibilities. Mm -hmm. They looked at their lives, they changed jobs, some of them became closer to friends, the bonds of friendship grew stronger, family ties grew stronger, it was clarity for them as what was important in their lives, and they grew spiritually, yeah. physically, emotionally. So that's post-traumatic growth that I'm seeing a lot of that people aren't aware of because we hear all about, oh, grief, collective grief, how are we going to deal with people now? We need to keep them at a distance because they're walking pathogens. But the flip side to it needs to be looked at as well. And we need to be compassionate towards people who are having a difficult time re-entering into quote-unquote normalcy. We've got yeah. to be gentle and compassionate because not everyone is gifted like you and I with that spirit of resilience and openness. But the flip side to it is there's a silent group who have got stronger and have welcomed these possibilities. Uh, I think that's your next book, PTG. I really do. I think <laughs> you should document the cases of people who have taken this wonderful opportunity in our history where we're no longer tied to an office, where we're liberated by digital media and have changed their lives for the better. They're no longer living in one place. They're no longer schlepping into a city, exhausted after commuting two or three hours from the suburbs into the city and then reversing it at night. You know, I, I think you're, it's really a great observation. Yeah, and, and I think we need to hear more about that because we are gifted with an optimism bias. We all are. But we're also hardwired, unfortunately, because of genetics in our past to look for danger. Our ancestors did, because there could be a tiger out there. So we're hyper alert to begin with, right? But yeah. we also need to temper that with looking at what Viktor Frankl talks about when he talks about optimism. And, and, and by that, what I mean is that we can't have hope without meaning or meaning without hope. So we have to think about optimism like a muscle, and you've got to practice it. Mm -hmm. Because I can ask you right now to smile with me. Try it. Just smile with me. All right, that's a real smile. I see it here. You're not cheating. Okay, so you know, <laughs> notice what's happening to you emotionally. I, I did it with you because I, I find it very interesting. Did you notice or you tell me what's happened to you right now in the interview as you smiled? You feel better. I can tell you as an actor that when I have to frown or make myself cry, I feel horrible. I, you know, I feel awful. Uh, and it takes a while to rebound. Um, and I know as a broadcaster where I smile a lot and I've learned to talk while smiling, I feel better. So, you know, what you wear on your face really dictates what's happening in your body. I feel I'm, I, I presume you concur. Uh, not only that, but I can reinforce it by telling you that it, the, in the neuroreceptors in the brain, you're tricking the brain to look for happiness. When you do that, you're, you're programming the brain to go on a treasure hunt for happiness. That's yeah. what you do. And you're starting to feel better. And you don't know why. Because smiling is contagious. Exactly. You know that? And happiness, not just the virus, the pandemic was contagious, but also happiness is contagious. You put one happy person in a room and you'll see what I mean. People gravitate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think we define charisma. It's kind of 
undefined, but that's what it is. Somebody who makes you feel good, somebody who makes you feel happy, somebody who sees something good in you that you might not see yourself. And I know it's funny, it's almost like a social experiment, but often I'll walk up to members of my family and just put on a silly grin, like a big smiley face till they're smiling and laughing because I'm making such a big smile. So you're right, there is definitely a positive contagion as well as a negative contagion. And it, it seems that people focus so much on their negative interactions. You can go about your day and meet 20 people and they've all been lovely to you. They wish you good morning. They've said kind things to you. One person, you know, flips you off while you're driving your car and then it's the end of your day. Why do you think that is? Because What's happening there is you're reacting to external circumstances. You're reacting to things that are happening in the environment. And I teach people to be proactive. Mm -hmm. So take a deep breath first and ask yourself, is this going to count in five hours time? This guy who just cut me off in, in traffic. Is this whatever it is that's causing me to feel really stressed out going to count in one year's time, in 10 years time? And if it isn't, can I walk away from that and pick a different emotion? Mm -hmm. I told you what William James said. But in, in my... Uh, in my backpack, I've got a whole series of strategies I can use. And that's what I want to share with you. You can say, for example, I'm going to exercise. That person really ticked me off. I'm going to go work it out. Work out. And in doing that, you feel better because you're releasing endorphins. And you're starting to look at things in a more realistic way instead of reacting. You're asking yourself, what choices do I have? And it's so important for us to say to each other, what do I choose to do today? How do I choose to spend today? Notice that we use monetary terms for time. Mm. Misspending it, spending it well, losing time. Okay, it's like, you know, our personal wealth portfolio. And I'm saying that if you can exercise, if you can think of going on the highway of gratitude every morning and finding a few things that you're grateful for, and then can you find things that you're happy about and Instagram those and put them on social media? When I went for a walk, I saw a hummingbird, took a picture of it. Okay, so I'm being silly, but I actually no. threw it. I said, hey, guys, look at this. We're in Victoria. I know in, in New York it's cold, but look at what I just saw. You know, we yeah. just share. And it's infectious when you start sharing. So you see social media has got a bad rep, but it, also, it can also do good things for people. If you can start sharing it, then other people will say, hey, I found this too. And what are they talking about? Through the back door, I'm encouraging people to go look for experiences that are non-monetary. Take time now. You've got time affluence. You've got some time on your hands. Go outside. Go to the art gallery, do different things. And more important, happy people invest in satisfying social relationships. You know, Theresa May, wasn't it in October? Yeah, October the 18th of 2018, or was it October 16th, maybe. She in the UK developed a ministry of loneliness. And she decided to tell people that the greatest problem we have right now in health is loneliness. And I have found the same thing here in North America. People are very lonely. Mm. And you, did you know that that is as bad? If you're extremely lonely, it's as bad as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. I believe it. It, it is really. So that's something else that, that we need to look at. And we also need to look at the whole concept of forgiveness. You talk about someone taking you off. But, you know, really, can you forgive? Because in forgiving, you take back your personal agency. You take back your power. And I'm all for people taking back their power, being productive, being proactive. Absolutely. What do you mean by your title, Happy is the New Healthy? I mean, and that's a really good question that you're asking, that I see it like a ham and cheese sandwich. Okay, if you're Jewish, let's forget about the, the ham. <laughs> let's call it a bagel, a, a quick cheese bagel with with, <laughs> with, with, with some locks. <laughs> yes, yeah, hey, right. that's pretty good, you know. Anyway, yeah. don't we salivate like Pavlov's dog because I like both and I'm not Jewish. But I'll tell you that it is a symbiotic relationship between your health, physical health, and your mental health. We have a psychological immune system that works very much like our physical immune system. You know, when you get a cold, you don't run to the doctor. You know that you need nutrition or diet. You need exercise. You need rest. That's your physical immune system helping you. Now, you also have a psychological immune system. And when it gets distressed, it breaks down. And our psychological immune system helps us bounce back move forward, be resilient. So I'm talking about if you're happy, you're going to have fewer cardiovascular problems. Mm -hmm. 
your immune system, your physical immune system is going to be better. You're going to find, like the research shows, that you get promoted at work because of happiness. You're going to sleep better. And guess what? You're going to live to a ripe old age. You might not like that, but it's true. Right. Uh, and the ones who did this, there was a Harvard study, a longitudinal one, you know, and John F. Kennedy was part of it. And what they found is that for these men, the happiest things in their lives were their relationships with their partners, significant mm -hmm. others, relationship with family, relationship with friends. Yeah. So I come back, you know, and tell you that that loneliness piece is something that needs to be addressed because you could be in a group with a lot of people and yet be lonely yeah. because you don't feel connection. So the connection is important. Purpose is important. What do you say to people who do seem to have a low set point for being happy? Is that changeable? Yes. Well, let me explain what I mean by that. When you say a low set point, the research shows that 50% of our happiness is due to DNA. That's your set point. Negative Nellies, positive Toms. Yeah. And 40% of your happiness is due to your deliberate intentional efforts and activities and thoughts. Mm -hmm. Only 10% is due to environmental factors. As you know, you know, becoming a paraplegic or winning the lottery. Okay, mm -hmm. a couple of months later, you go back to your set point. So I think in terms of what you're saying, if a person is feeling down, which is, I think, what you're asking, if mm -hmm. they're feeling really low, uh, I I would say, first of all, let's just check it and make sure that there is no, nothing organic or physical that's causing this feeling, mm -hmm. or if they have a bipolar affective disorder or any of that. So we take that out of the equation. If it's just a regular person like you and I, it's normal to feel a bit down. So I would say to people, including myself, embrace it. Make a list of all of those feelings you're having right now. It's not just down. What else do you feel? Hopeless, helpless. Right. Tell me everything. Anxious, worried about your future. Okay, so they list it all first. And then they ask themselves, what choices do they have? By going back to the past, we all have a past. How did you cope with this in the past? Because you know, when you're in that rabbit hole of depression, it feels like forever. It feels like time, oh my goodness, it's like a nightmare. You shut your eyes, it continues, you know? But mm -hmm. I say, just a minute in here, go back to the past. When when you felt down in the past, I'm curious, help me to understand what happened then. And they will tell me how they got out of it. And then their, their face changes. They're, they're actually feeling, the shoulders relax. Hey, this is what I did. Okay. And I'm wondering, can we use some of those tools moving forward? Mm. You know, remember what Maslow said? If all you have is a hammer in your toolbox, guess how, what happens when you try and change a light bulb? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so I would go to their past, honor that, and then link that into what we can do now. Because you remember what I said, optimism is like a muscle. You've got to train it. So you start looking at things in your life because when you're feeling down, you feel disconnected. You feel no one cares for you. There's no purpose. Everything is pointless. Okay, fine. But tell me some things in the past that kept you alive. I mean, you're talking to me today. So obviously you didn't die. How, how did you cope then? I want to know. And can we use some of that in the future? I'm just curious. And you know, it's amazing how people are resilient and what they can do by honoring those feelings. And that's what I said earlier on when I said there's something called toxic positivity, and I hate that with a passion. What, because, what is toxic positivity? You know, you have to be happy at all times. And if you're feeling unhappy, feel guilty. Because look at your neighbor over there. You know, that's ridiculous. Right. You can't be happy at all times unless you're schizophrenic, <laughs> you know, or certifiable. Then you right. got that smile, that grin, not a real smile, a grin on your face all the time. I'm going to lock you right. up, buddy. You know, it's a, <laughs> You don't need that. Exactly. So you are going to feel, I tell people, I'm going to be anxious at times. I can choose, however, how I'm going to deal with that, you know? Mm. I come back to choice. We all have choices. Yeah. Do you feel that mental health plays a role in achieving happiness and that some of the medications that we're giving out are either life-changing, salvation, overprescribed? What 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 are your thoughts? Let me stay within the framework of being a psychologist, and let me okay. say, so I'm just going to stay within my parameters. Mm -hmm. I would say, and also through my years of experience, that some people 
because of a chemical imbalance, they do need an SSRI or an antidepressant to help them bump them up. But the research shows that in a clinical state of depression, the medication alone will not help them. Medication plus therapy together really works. Yeah. So it prevents relapse, you know, which is something we're always concerned about. You might be okay now, but how can I control that moving forward? Like tell I me said, about, okay, I'm sorry. I tell my patients, you know, I want you to need me as much as you need a hemorrhoidectomy. So let's get on with the program of getting well. <laughs> exactly. You get, you get the point, huh? So I'm yes. saying at times, if it's situational, maybe they do not need an, an antidepressant. Right. Okay. I think, however, your question is a very good one. Namely, are we over prescribing people? And if we are doing that, to what purpose? Yeah. Is this creating a dependency on the part of the individual and taking away their sense of autonomy? Remember I talked about choice? Yeah. And me telling patients, you're going to need me as much as you need an appendectomy it means there's mm -hmm. going to be none of that a dependency, but we're going to move forward with strategies that you can use for the rest of your life. Tell but me I, about I, some of the strategies you describe in your book. Oh, well, I talk about uh, I talk about several things. I talk about the, the fact that uh, you, body dysmorphic disorder is something that a lot of women are experiencing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason they're experiencing that is partially due to social media. Mm -hmm. You you look on social media, you see the air buffed figure and, and you can hardly pull up your jeans, you know, because even if you mm -hmm. suck in the belly, that, you know, you're no longer 12 years old. You mm -hmm. might be postmenopausal for heaven's sakes, you know, don't expect it to work like that. Yeah. But can we have some air buffed models as we are currently getting finally in the media in their 60s and 70s and 80s mm. and celebrate the fact that we're all aging and that's not a, something to be scared of, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a very important point. Yeah. So uh, the, str so the strategies, about, I'm sorry, go ahead. So when we go into the strategies, I would say, first of all, limit your social media consumption i would say also limit your news consumption because news is usually bad and that's why if it bleeds it reads so do not listen to the news after 6 p.m turn off your devices yeah. have some time to do what you're talking about to just have quiet time with your family or friends or whatever you choose to do um another strategy i say that's very important apart from limiting social media is comparisons why are you comparing to others when your thumbprints are different, no two thumbprints are the same. Yeah. So I'm talking about the fact that we need to compare to ourselves and to quit feeling that you're not good enough to get rid of perfectionistic traits. The only thing that's perfect in my house is my coffee maker. And when it, mm -hmm. it doesn't work, I throw it out. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we, so we need to embrace the fact that as human beings, we are prone to error. We're prone to making mistakes, but can I embrace them and brag about them instead of hiding them? See, because happy people get promotions at work. Did you know that? And the reason they get yeah. at, at university too, they move up in whatever they're doing. Why? Because they have a way of looking at life in a different way. They use the growth mindset, not the, you know, with the growth mindset, life is going to be challenging, but I know how to learn from it. So that's something else that I put in the backpack for people to look at. Another thing that's perhaps very important is uh, relationships, mm -hmm. social relationships. Invest in satisfying social relationships. Develop a new hobby. Be curious about life. Don't stagnate. What's, what's something that you're going to do now to create Botox in your brain or neuro neuroplasticity, as I say? Mm -hmm. I learn a new language. Uh, pick up a new hobby learn to play an instrument, whatever you're doing, you're going to create neuroplasticity, which is going to prevent us from uh, the brain atrophying and us aging prematurely. So th those are just some of the things that I talk about. I talk about the importance of looking at your life in a way that is compassionate, accepting, and moving forward with it from a feedback model, not a failure model. So I'm talking a lot about the thought, the space between your ears and how you change it realistically, not, you know, 
thinking everything is great because everything is not great. But how can I make it something that is of use to me and to my family? Another thing that's important is for meaning in life. As we started this interview and we talked about meaning in life and being very important, I think it's important as well to say to yourself, what am I doing today to contribute to society? What am I doing to contribute? Can I give back? Can I do a random act of kindness today for someone just because? And there's no reason why. You just want to do that. Those are some of the things that we can do to make ourselves feel fulfilled. Yeah. Yeah. yeah little little things in life. I mean, like I do things like I'll look after my elderly neighbors. Like I know they don't have a lot of visitors or something. So I'll go to the bakery and pick them up a pie and drop off a pie. And my wife will be like, what are you doing that for? You have such a tofu heart. You know, you just, I said, because nobody's seen them all day and this will be the highlight of their day. So I'm going to drop off a pie and make their day. And I know I'm making their day, but I'm also making my day. It's not a selfish thing, but I feel good doing things for other people. So that's brilliant what you just said, because I tell people when you do things like you have just done, you get a greater bang for your buck. You might have spent 20 bucks on that pile, who knows how much, but you feel like a million bucks after. Yeah. See? Yeah. So I think that you're not even being altruistic. You're doing something for yourself too. Right. And that's that's how I get people to do more of the random acts of kindness. I said, put yourself first. Huh? Yeah, I say, put yourself first. Do it for you. And then someone gives, says to me, oh, thank you, Joan. I said, what are you thanking me for? I, I already got my thank you. I'm feeling good. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's been shown in the research, by the way, that when you give to others, you feel better. It's like, in, as I said to you, how much money do you need to be happy in life? Only 100,000, by the way. Food, <laughs> shelter, and the rest. Anything right. over that, you're just buying stuff. But you know about the hedonic treadmill. You'll get some a new gadget, then get bored with it and have to buy something else. So why not just go to a hockey game, invest in something that in is interrupted like go with your family on a holiday now the you know the borders are open we can do those things right. do things that or go on a picnic do things that have nothing to do with a lot of money right. and you feel better yeah. mm -hmm. like a lot of life it lies in action and activity whether you're actively loving a member of your family whether you're actively helping a neighbor whether you're getting yourself out there to exercise, that's where you're going to find that meaning that's going to give your life happiness, right? Correct, because happiness is not something we acquire. It's something we manufacture. Mm -hmm. you hear what I said? So I have created in my, I have an algorithm I use and I say, okay, just imagine if you will, that you have a computer on the motherboard. I'm going to give you eight things to put on that motherboard. And in the morning, when you wake up, pick one or two of those activities and do them. At night, when you go to bed, decide what you're going to be doing tomorrow. So again, if I want to be grateful, I want to pick gratitude. I want to do the Sunday, Sunday gratitude deal with my family, make a meal or whatever. So what I'm doing is becoming very proactive and intentional about how I spend my time. Mm -hmm. And in the morning, I check my motherboard. And before going to the email or anything, I'm checking to see what am I going to do on my happiness control panel that's going to be good for me. And so we do that every day. And at night, we ask ourselves, what went well for me today and why? Mm -hmm. You have to ask yourself that question, and I'll tell you why it's exciting. Because when you get into the why, it goes back to what you asked me a few minutes ago about how do you deal with a depressive individual. When you get them to do an exercise like that, they go, wow, I had more control than I thought. Mm -hmm. This happened because of me. Doesn't yeah. matter what what's out there. Yeah. I think with people who are sad or depressed or unhappy, I guess they need to do an accounting of their life to see if there's a reason they are unhappy, sad, or depressed, and if they can change it. If they're unhappy in their marriage, if they're unhappy with the relationship they have with their children, if they're unhappy with their work or their job, taking a look at the things that you're doing, the things that you're investing in, and how you can make them better, improve them, or perhaps get rid of them, will add to your happiness. Do you agree with that? Yes, because you're being intentional. But let me just throw a fly in the ointment for you. Mm -hmm. Thinking of a case I carried recently. And here is a woman who has had cancer, three multiple you know, times of cancer. She's been married for, for 47 years, two children, husband, the whole nine yards, very wealthy woman. But she isn't happy in her marriage. Mm. 
And she wonders at this stage in her life as she approaches her 70s, should I leave or should I stay? See, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult. It depends on your circumstances. It's not always cut and dry. Right. Uh, you know, there are times when you have to say to yourself, okay, if I if I give in for if I give in to this, what do I get on the other side? Yeah. So sometimes you might make a decision, you might choose. Ah, this is it. But if you choose and say to yourself, I choose to stay in this relationship and get these things out of it, then you're not feeling like the victim, but you're feeling, you know, like the ingenious survivor. Right. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. See that? Yeah. No, it, it definitely is situational. It definitely does depend on your circumstances. And like you said, a 70 year old person is having second doubts about their marriage after being married, maybe 40, 45 years, really needs to weigh that consideration, that uh, decision with a lot of deliberation, because, you know, these could be the last few years of their lives. You know, I, I, I think. I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think there's nothing sadder than seeing an old couple who've been married 30, 40, 50 years break up. You feel like, was everything, I know probably everybody feels like this whenever a relationship breaks up, where you wonder if everything was a lie. But when you've invested, you know, a lifetime with a person and then the breakup is just almost inconceivable to me. It's difficult. I mean, in my clinical experience, I've seen a lot. And uh, that's why I say sometimes in life, you and I looking at things on the outside, don't know the whole story. True. You know? And we exactly. need to, we need to be compassionate and say, you know, okay, I don't know the whole story. And I want to stay out of it. You know, yeah. I tell my couples, if they're fighting, the worst thing to do is run and tell your friends. Because your friends are going to give you gratuitous advice. Oh, he's just a jerk. Oh, she's terrible. She's a barge. Right, so right, right. Get rid, get rid of her, right? And exactly. then guess what happens? They don't listen to me. They run off and do this to their friends. Right. They get back together. I would think thanks to some of the things we do in the session. Mm -hmm. And then their friends, they've lost a whole bunch of friends. You didn't yeah. listen to me. You didn't listen to me. You're just a waste of time. I don't want to hear about you. You're back mm -hmm. together. I don't even want to hear about it. Exactly. So, you yeah, be careful who you seek advice from. They might be saying just what you need to hear or want to hear as opposed to what you should be hearing. Before we leave today, what do you want our audience most to know about happiness and how will they be impacted when they read your book? I think the most important thing I want people to know is that happiness is something each and every one of us can manufacture. 40% of our happiness is our deliberate, intentional efforts and activities and thoughts. Please remember that when you read my book. And more important, remember that happiness is a habit. So I challenge you to spend 30 days of your life doing the things I've asked you to do, from exercise to forgiveness to whatever else. And then send me an email and let me know how it worked. Because it's going to become automatic for you. It's going to be like brushing your teeth. Oh, I know I got to exercise now, but I get to exercise versus I have to exercise. See? Yeah. So it's a habit. And I really want you to habituate to happiness. Wonderful, wonderful advice. Happiness is not acquired, happiness is manufactured, making happiness a habit. And habits generally take about 30 days or so to become a habit. Great advice. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. My pleasure and privilege. Thank you. I've learned a lot. The privilege is all mine. The name of the book is Happy is the New Healthy. It is written by Dr. Joan Nihal. It is a wonderful book. She's an extremely intelligent person who was also a very happy person. And that shows in her demeanor. It shows in her language. It shows in her writing. Thanks again. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time, on Spot. Thank you.